We're going to go live. Uh, boom, boom, bam with the great Jim Gale. Um, that is interesting. Um, and I'd love to talk about, uh, get into that, get into energy, get into um, really some of the hidden science or the, the least the science that's been obfuscated, the real science. Um, yeah. And uh, what you see coming from all your amazing connections jim because you are really tapped in yeah i i'm in the flow i let go of the fear a year ago i let go of the effort i let go of the struggle and it's every day is a magical day now and i have times that aren't magical there's no doubt about it but i'm aware of those times i'm aware of how i feel and when i sense something that doesn't feel in spirit or inspired or enthusiastic then I step back and I go meditate for a little bit and I pop back in. And so that process has been something I've been at for decades, but it's starting, it feels like it's, I've passed something, but letting go of the fear was the main thing. Yeah, and that's what I'm looking forward to talking with you about today, Jim, is you are a multi-dimensional human being, man, man, like we're going to get into food forests. We'll get into permaculture. Uh, we'll discuss the solutions, but also I just want to hear more about you and your life because it's so inspiring. We, you know, I interviewed you, interviewed you during the event, uh, the summit we did, uh, uh, geez, when was that two months ago, almost now. And we touched mostly on food forests and permaculture, but I really want to dive more into your life story. I know bear is very interested in that too. And, and, getting into what abundance really means for you and how you're able to transform your life into what it is now, which is living your dream, changing people's lives on the daily, working, getting your hand in the soil every day. And really your, um, your energy just emits that, that, um, that truth of what you're living right now. So I'm going to hit record. We are live and I will fire up the podcast. Uh, Bear Lando, are you ready to go live? I'm ready. Uh, so, Jim, just so you know, um, you know, you haven't you and I haven't had a chance to talk much, but um, in uh, my past and everything I did, you know, I took a different approach in uh, laboratory science and things. And what we do with our agriculture is literally apply uh, the alchemical principles, which is full uh, beyond just mechanistic chemistry, but looking at those primal forces, but then verifying that we're actually doing it and we're not just trying to dabble in some, you know, metaphysical concepts. So, um, you know, what we're doing here is not just in medicine and in my laboratory, but taking agriculture to that same level because the three of them are inseparable if you understand how that works. And, uh, well, well, we'll, uh, go ahead, start us off, Mike, and then, uh, we'll get this thing going looking yes, forward to it and thanks for being with us by the way this is awesome oh, and thank you i'm learning stuff already just hearing you <laughs> okay three two one and boom we're back for another episode of alpha cast i'm mike winner and i'm here as always with dr bear paul lando coming to you live and direct from the beautiful smith river up here in the great state of jefferson where freedom still reigns supreme. Um, so fortunate to be here. Um, we've had a lot of friends that are visiting and moving here, uh, and the co-op is just exploding. Alpha Vedic is exploding. Uh, just got back from the Greater Reset, wearing my Greater Reset tee here, actually, Jim, here Love that uh, I got at the event uh, there in Austin. Uh, and Jim Gale is with us today. We got to hang out pretty much every day in Austin last week. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about that, but just very excited to have Jim on, uh, on the show today, uh, talking about some of our favorite topics, permaculture, food forests, resiliency, self-sovereignty, food, food uh, awareness, um, spreading uh, abundance across the plain. Uh, yeah, it's uh, going to be a great talk today. Uh, for those that are new to Alpha Vedic, uh, we spell it with an F, A-L-F-A-V-E-D-I-C. Uh, because we're rebels and <laughs> we didn't go pH. Uh, you can find out everything about us at alphavedic.com, A L F A V E D I C.com. Uh, Bear Lando will be talking at the great Anarchapoco uh, in just a couple weeks here. So he will be virtually 
doing uh, his talk again. Uh, a little hard to get away from the uh, farm down to Mexico, even though we would love to be there. Shout out to Berwick and Kat and the whole crew at Anarchapoco. Uh, shout out to Lutz and uh, the pirate uh, homies down there, Pirate Chain. They were at Greater Reset. They were driving down from Austin to Mexico uh, for that. So love you guys and everybody that's gonna be down in Anarchapoco. We wish we could be there with you. Alpha Vedic will have a virtual booth and we'll be doing the whole virtual thing again this year uh, with the intention to really be there next year. So forgive us for not being there in person. Um, but yeah, let's uh, get this party started with Jim Gale. Bear, any uh, housekeeping uh, things to bring up before we bring Jim on? No, I just want to get into our talk with Jim today. So let's go for it. Okay, great. Uh, Jim Gale uh, basically uh, is the man, the myth, the legend. Uh, would you like to uh, throw a huge monkey wrench into the plans of the would-be controller's agenda of contrived shortages, supply chain slowdowns, and the subsidized destruction of our food supply? Quote, your food forest landscape blueprint will be fully customized to your climate, planting zone, topography space, as well as to the beauty, functionality, and abundance you wish to have. What if you could become healthier and share your abundance with others in the process? Renowned food forest expert Jim Gale joins us on this episode to share all of the ins and outs for self-empowerment through food independence. Quote, I am in your depth permaculture educated. I'm your in-depth permaculture educator who will teach you regardless of your experience level from Jim. At age 19, Jim first learned about the power of writing his goals. From the practice, practice of inspired visioning, he became a four-time All-American and national champion wrestler. After college, he moved to Hawaii backpacked through 37 countries, lived with the Maasai, explored cultures, and searched for his next inspired vision. He wrote his goals again at age 29, which included being retired in three years. Jim went on to create a mortgage company that reached $1.3 billion in sales in three years, leading him to early retirement and the achievement of another life goal. He bought a boat, lived on the ocean for a year, and then moved to Costa Rica to build eco-villages where he discovered permaculture. It changed his life. And he realized he needed to bring it to every household in the world. The idea whose time has come became food forest abundance. Jim speaks about sovereignty, entre entrepreneurship, mindset, and freedom. Jim is absolutely a man after our own hearts here at the Alphabetic Permaculture Farm. And we couldn't think of a more qualified or enthusiastic spokesman for inspiring the new agrarian revolution. Bear Lando, this would be a good one today. Doing good, doing good here. It's uh, unseasonably cold at night. I'm a little worried, you know, we've got this extended frost and I just hope our, uh, our little uh, plant creatures underground are gonna escape it this year. Otherwise I gotta do a whole lot more planting in the springtime. Hey Jim, good to have you here, buddy. Uh, you know, we haven't uh, talked yet, but uh, I've been really looking forward to this. And, uh, you know, just to start, well, first off, um, you were a national champion uh, wrestler. I can't let that go by, you know, because uh, Michael will tell you whenever I've got a fellow jock on, we've got to talk story. You know, when I was a freshman college player, the, uh, the college coach for the wrestling team tried to recruit me as a heavyweight. And I said, no freaking way. You guys work too hard. You know, us football <laughs> players a little lazier. So uh, <laughs> anyway, so where did you wrestle? I wrestled at MSU in uh, Southern Minnesota in Mankato, Minnesota. Mm -hmm. And I got a fun story about the football team. It was always our wrestlers, one of our most fun days of the year when the football players who took the one credit class of wrestling would come up and have their first wrestling practice and half of them would be puking. We'd actually bring up an extra bucket up, an extra trash can up so they could puke <laughs> in the <laughs> trash can. And we, that just tickled us pink. We love that, man. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I imagine there's a there's a great uh, sort of friendly competition between the different kinds of athletes in any, yeah. uh, you know, college program. We used to do wrestling, you know, like these three hour wrestling, uh, th three hour. Yeah, right. Three minute wrestling drills in winter workouts. And, you know, three minutes seem like an eternity when you're on the mat, you know, and of course, it was jungle wrestling because you're usually wrestling with some defensive end or something. We didn't know what the hell we we're doing other than just throwing <laughs> elbows at each other. Oh, that's dangerous. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yep. I know. 
So, uh, but hey, good to have you here. You know, just a little bit of background and why I'm so excited and what you're doing. And yeah, I've looked over your program and it's amazing just bringing these concepts to the world and also bringing it in a way where, you know, it can really spread far and wide because that's what we need right now is a lot of people becoming more independent, empowered through that. And then, uh, like I wrote in your little uh, intro there, you know, throw a monkey wrench into these uh, guys that are just trying to control us with food and everything. So uh, back in 1975, my wife and myself got into our first off-grid uh, little mini farm situation. Uh, Mike, that's where your buddy Bryden was born up in the hills there above Calistoga in Northern California. So uh, that was our first foray. We learned a lot. You know, we had our animals and, you know, and our, our gardens and then actually started growing a lot of medicinal herbs and things. Uh, we moved on to Hawaii during my career years. We had an off-grid 12-acre plantation there. Totally different kind of um, farming operation, you know. It was a lot of fruit, tropical medicinals. And, um, and then uh, we went to the northern uh, California coast, you know, not that long ago. Had a very well-developed farm and uh, did our thing there. And now we're in our fourth place, which is... Um, more uh, different kind of almost mountainous terrain in the canyons. And we uh, owned and operated two different uh, commercial nurseries in the process. So we've been around the block. Uh, we did, um, you know, our permaculture uh, and master gardener certifications, but you know, that was just kind of academic because we've been doing it for so long. My point of my story is that, um, there's a lot of people that want to jump into this and your service is fantastic as far as getting them on the fast track because no two pieces of land are the same. Uh, no two people's needs are the same. And we really had to learn a lot with every new, uh, you know, little farm that we've developed, including the one right now that we're still learning about because the land really has a story to tell uh, it will direct a lot of your activities. So you have to develop that other in between the line snack of uh, just sort of tuning in. And, yeah. uh, you know, uh, the other thing, you know, before when, when we were all talking uh, before we went live here is that there's this other whole element that I'm really excited that you're uh, uh, not just open to, but uh, it sounds like pretty active in. And what we're developing here is understanding how to do agriculture more from an alchemical perspective and not just look at the, you know, phosphorus, potassium and nitrogen and, you know, think we're doing it organic if we're buying organic. You know, it's really looking at those other vectors, the resonance that comes from the skies above us and doing everything as a unified whole you know, with what's going on above, on the ground, and then appreciating it's about getting those uh, more resonant vectors right in the ground. And there's ways to actually do that test for it. So that's the sort of stuff I'd love to get into. But you have an amazing story. Uh, you're uh, 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 an achiever, to say the least, you know, at your young age, all that you've done. So maybe start us off just with a little bit of a history as far as uh, how you did everything and then uh, find yourself to permaculture and then into some of these other topics we're talking about. Oh, well, thank you, Baron and Mike. I love you guys. I'm really excited about this chat. Um, so I'm going to talk about the failures because the failures taught me infinitely more than the successes. Um, my first failure, I was a wrestler and I had done pretty good. I got third as a sophomore and I I was rated first in the state um, my junior year. All, all, like, I was a shoe in, right? <laughs> Which is it always means you're screwed. Anyway, um, the after the state finals, where I got beat to a guy by a guy named Jerry Martin, who I had wrestled five times in a row and beat him five times in a row, um, he beat me the sixth time, which was in the state finals. Um, it, it's magical in a way. Wow. He happened to have the exact same birthday as me, which is Christmas Eve, 1969. Anyway, it was a, it was the worst experience of my life at the time and the best experience of my life at the time at the same time. And the point of the story is all failures are just feedback, right? And, and I, of course, I didn't know this back then. I went through two years of just, I was messed up. 
Um, my senior year, I completely failed, didn't even place, lost first round, right? I had that psychological breakdown, which is what is kind of a metaphor for what's going on in the whole world right now. It's, it's, it's an ascension time. It's a, the Tesla said, if you want to find the secrets to the universe, and, and this is the one word he said wrong. He said, think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration. I actually think Tesla didn't say that. I think that was part of the rewriting of history that these psychopaths have done. The word is feel. Feel in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration. Feeling and thinking are really, in one perspective, polar opposites of each other, right? One is completely in the mind, and it's a disconnect from the feeling. And the feeling is where it's at, right? So feel in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration. So I started studying this type of thing, and, and then I'll, I'll jump forward. Um, it was, I had a really good run in college. I wrote my goals at basically 19 while I was... In fact, the goals were what helped me come out of the suffering and the, and the loss and the, I was lost in life. I didn't have any clue what was next. Writing my goals and creating a future in my mind on paper that felt inspired, that was the catalyst then for a good run. I was, um, after writing my goals, I was a different human being. The person who left the wrestling room on a Friday night and the person who showed up on a Monday morning were two very different people. And I actually got uh, elected captain of the wrestling team. I was actually a freshman in college, which is very rare if in the NCAAs um, because I was just inspired. I had so much fun that people wanted to elect me captain. So I ended up being a four-time All-American and national champ. And then I got a um got on a plane and moved to hawaii i lived there for four years started as a bar back and there's a theme that keeps coming up throughout this period of throughout my whole life and that's people say you can't do that that's impossible that's crazy um when i first in fact handed my goals to my wrestling coach who i love and who's my mentor dr gary rushing he actually smirked and said these goals are kind of lofty don't you think and it was too late because i had lived it in my in my being at some level so same thing happened i got home after traveling and i had goals of being retired in three years with three million dollars that was specifically my goal previous to that i was living in uh, surfers paradise australia i just got a backpack and i was by myself just traveling around i stayed there for about four months and when i first got there i said i'm gonna get a job because i was broke i'm gonna get a job on the strip um, in, in the bar business and everybody, I was at a youth hostel and they all laughed at me. They said, that's impossible. You cannot for certain, you cannot get a job in this area. You have to go up and pick fruit up, uh, in Northern, uh, Australia, up along cans and all these places. And I, I said, okay, whatever. I, I ignore that. And I, I had a job in one day, right on the strip bartending, right? It was a lot of fun at a pizza place, it was just amazing. So anyway, I go every day to um, Bond University and I would just walk in the library and I go up and I studied Napoleon Hill and Zig Ziglar and Jim Rohn and Dennis Waitley, The Psychology of Winning. Oh my gosh, what an epic experience. And I started to believe what they were saying to be true. And I started asking, well, if, if what they're saying is true, then I'm going to go crazy again. I'm going to write crazy goals. You know, I was a wrestler previous to those goals. So I had some basis for writing those goals. I was not a money person. I didn't know anything about finance or money or how to make money. I mean, for gosh sakes, I had a teaching degree with bartending experience. I wrote that I wanted to be, uh, have $3 million in three years. And I got home and my, my roommates who had just graduated, they were now engineers and they were very proud of their jobs and great guys. And, you know, they, they did really well. And they were mad at me for having the goal that I had. And I mean, we were having beers on our way out. I'll never forget the moment. We're sitting around this table. And they said, Jim, one guy, his name is Pete. He got angry. And he's like, Jim, that's not the way you got to do this and this and this. And I, I thought that was funny because... I, I don't know. I, I never listen to people when they tell me I can't do something. So I just thought it was humorous. Three years later, I was telling Pete, I said, what do you think now? And he's like, yep, <laughs> you did it. 
uh, we did a billion three in volume and, and and it's magical like there's no i'm not well i'm not gonna say that about myself i know everybody is has all of the things i'm talking about everybody has the same foundational possibilities in life right i don't have anything that anybody else doesn't have i got seasoned school because i couldn't pay attention to the teacher because the stuff going on in my head was way more exciting than what was going on up in front of the room. So I simply couldn't pay attention. They call that ADD. Thank God for ADD. Thank God for the apocalypse. <laughs> I mean, this is the best time in the history of the world. So that's kind of the first little bit. Uh, I ended up buying a boat, living on the ocean for a year, and I was incredibly bored at, uh, doing that. I actually started writing poetry which is just freaking hilarious from when I think about it like I, I was right and I'm like this is pretty freaking good right so I spent a lot of time asking what's next and I started a foundation through the mortgage company called the wisdom foundation my goal was to get emotional intelligence taught in every school in the country my buddy Blaine Niven and I we created this and it was our intention to bring the tools and the wisdom that I had learned from these greats to the world. Like, why wasn't that like the foundational teaching in every school? Of course, I didn't know about the deep state. I didn't know about the control grid or any of that stuff at that time. It was confusing to me. And to anybody out there listening who's maybe on the edge of kind of awakening as to what the actual problem of our world is, there's no more confusion. There's no more illusion once you see past the veil right? That's what the apocalypse means is the unmasking or the lifting of the veil or the great reveal, right? Once you see the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain, then there's no more confusion as to why we're using poisons all over the place, why the media promotes fear and destruction and all of these disconnects in our world. So um, any questions so far? I know I feel like I'm rambling. <laughs> Keep rambling. No, no, you're you're great. I, I love hearing this. And you know, what what of course has happened is we've been brought into this um materialistic mindset. And I hear about your success. And obviously you have a passion for the creative process, not just making three million bucks. And which also explains why you were maybe a little bored just sitting out on a boat because you're a very creative person. You know, I studied Napoleon Hill and some of those folks long ago. And they used to go by themselves, off by themselves, and really connect with spirit and uh, understand, you know, not just that connection, but how to be a conduit for that. And then, uh, you know, manifest not for the sake of manifesting the money or the or the the food independence. It was all about the empowerment, realizing that you are a co-creator. And uh, boy, when you do that, it sure gets fun. And that's what you really emanate, which is what I love about your message. It's uh, it's not the, uh, uh, you know, the 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 end thing. It's about the process. So uh, yeah, you're you're doing great. So just continue on. Awesome, awesome, fun stuff. So this this idea too about money. Like at the time, I didn't have any money, and money was really important. And I didn't know there was another level of things I did subconsciously and I did internally somehow because, but I, I didn't put my finger on it as clearly as I have now, which by the way, changes every single day. It evolves every single day because I'm now so aware of the feelings that I have inside that when I'm off track, I, you know, I think I said already, I just take it, but it's worth repeating deep breath. How do I feel? Okay. That's interesting go lay down or go play tennis or go fishing or just go enjoy something, go do something for somebody that makes you feel good. So um, after the experience on the boat, I, uh, and then, oh, I went back and I, I started talking to the schools about it, doing speeches and kind of really getting this out there. And the schools were not interested at all. And I, I couldn't figure that out again. I was like, why the frick aren't they interested in this? This is gold, right? And some teachers were interested, but the higher you went up in the food chain, the less they were interested. In fact, it was very interesting. They actually got offended when I would bring them these, these ideas because that's how, that's their energy. That's where they sit, they live and they reside in shame. 
the people that are destroying our world, they're, they're controlled by shame and fear and rage. That is the program that they're unaware of. Right. So to inspire the awareness of this program. In fact, I like to throw out the word choice when people say it was their choice to do something. No, it was not. The word choice is one of the most misused words in our language because it implies the awareness of choice. And there's no awareness of choice in 99 percent of these actions. Really, it's because everybody does the best they can. Always. It's impossible not to with what they understand based on their overstanding and understanding of what is happening around them. So should we hate them? No, hate is destructive, right? Should we not do business with them? Yes, that's a pretty good idea. <laughs> uh, so I, I then found Costa Rica and, and Nicaragua and I fell in love. I've always been nature boy. That's what they teased me growing up like because I had frogs in my pocket and I was always chasing turtles and ducks and I always had a pet animal of some kind in the house and so when I found the jungle of Costa Rica I was actually driving from Nicaragua to Costa Rica and I had the radio on and I opened up the car door in Dominical and you could feel the life the cicadas were so loud that you'd have to scream into the phone to hear somebody on the other side and I said oh my god I'm home it was it just was this resonance and again uh, so it was 2006 seven i had spent millions of dollars buying all the green gold we call it we could buy and i didn't know yet what was going on in the world it was two, and then 2007 came i had my first two daughters i learned permaculture and i learned that we're destroying and mining and poisoning our, our earth's resources at a radically unsustainable level um, and I red pilled all at the same freaking time, which is by it's a cooperative incidence, right? And I went through hell because I was asking the question, what's the world going to be like for my daughters in 20 or 30 years? And at that time, I was still programmed by the climate change narrative. Right. I was listening to Guy McPherson and these people talk about doomsday and the end of the world because of how people are destroying our planet. And then, but at the same time, I started realizing, realizing, seeing clearly that it's not the people that are the impetus or the catalyst for this destruction. It's the same families that have always been there to control the mind. In fact, Goethe said, none are more hopelessly enslaved than those who falsely believe they are free. When I was first told I was a slave, I was like, oh, fuck off. I'm not a slave. I can do anything I want. Oh, really? How much money did you pay in taxes last year? 180,000. Where did that money go? War. Do you agree with war? No. That's a slave, my friends. Right. So anyway, I feel like taking a break again and just sharing that that's kind of the what led up to what's happening now. Jim, what was your uh, yeah. red pill moment? Like what initiated that yeah. for you? Thank you, Mike. And, you know, I, I think it's so great to talk about our red pill moments because there's a lot of arrogance out there on all sides of this. I, I would say far less arrogance on the side of the truth because our goal is to simply help people. But, but I like to point out the fact that I was asleep and most everybody was asleep at one point. We were programmed. We were stormtroopers for the evil psychopaths, whatever you want to call it. There's different levels that I've explored. All right, three in particular. But um, so my red pill moment was I was sitting at a table in um, in San Isidro, Costa Rica, at this little expat little dinner table, like right on the main strip. And there were some guys at the end of the table. It was a very eclectic group. There was a, a former CIA agent, former New York cop, uh, an artist, a teacher. My dad was a pipe fitter, a homeless person, and a couple others. Right. And everybody's telling their their realities and these guys at the end said jim you know 9 11 was an inside job and i said oh shut up it was not that's impossible it's impossible that that many people can be involved in something so wicked all right that's how ignorant i was and they said okay jim because i was there's one difference where i never ever advocated for force and violence against another person no matter what so that's the difference based on some of these people that are are willful 
advocates for force and violence. Um, but so I was willing to go look at the Zeitgeist show that they sent out to me. And from that moment forward, I understood humanity at a much hey, deeper hey, level. Hey, Jim, you, you broke up there. You're willing to go look at what? Um, a Zeitgeist, the show Zeitgeist. And from that moment forward, I had a deeper understanding of what was happening around the world. And yeah, so that was my red pill moment. Oh, that's amazing. No, yeah. Jim, I, it's, um, it, it's. I was just going to say wanna... there. Yeah, well, I was just going to say on the Zeitgeist thing, you know, that's what's so amazing about people that go out and make that kind of media because it has a major effect. And for me, I remember it was before Zeitgeist, it was Alex Jones and what, whether you want to say, He's a controlled op or whatever. His film Endgame, which preceded um, Zeitgeist, for me was like a big moment where he tied in all that together where you could see. Do you remember that movie, Bear, Endgame? Um, where it, it was, oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was like, whoa. And guess what? Like most of that's happened now. <laughs> so I was just wanted to make a comment on that. So like, Thank God for people making documentaries like that, because I think those are a major way a lot of people um, have that. Oh, absolutely. Media is. And that's why we do what we do. You know, you get out on the, on some form of the tube and, and people listen all of a sudden for some reason. Yeah. So, you know, Jim, what I just wanted to comment on is you, you talked about red pilling, waking up. You know, waking up to me, the way I look at it, it's a process. And I think there's a little bit of glamour sometime, even within the truth movement of people saying, oh, I, I when I woke up or but, you know, we can uh, wake up to the fact that maybe the Federal Reserve isn't on the up and up and you, uh, you know, wrap your mind around that. That doesn't mean you're home free now, but you have opened to a certain level and now you're ready to tackle the next level of the Maya, you know, the, the Mayaism. And, and it really never ends. As long as we're an embodiment, it's proof of the pudding that we still need waking up to do. So I just don't want our audience to um, think that any of us are considering some of us, you know, more woke than others or, or anything. It's, it's a process. But I will say one thing, uh, there's a big difference between being asleep uh, and I have no problem admitting that I'm still asleep in many ways. But when you're aware that you're asleep, you're over a huge hump, the awareness and you already brought up awareness. And that's the, that's the key word. When you're aware that you're asleep, now you can observe yourself and you can keep waking up and then you really accelerate the process. And then you really get kind of a kick out of waking up, you know, it becomes fun rather than some ominous negative thing, finding out about what all the demons of the world are doing, because waking up to the next level, you realize that there's actually way more good things happening in this uh, universe than there are these, these, uh, you know, these little imbeciles, these hall monitors on, on this particular plane. So uh, just wanted to throw that in. Uh, I love it. And waking up is like treasure hunting where you're guaranteed to find a treasure. Like it's, it's the best treasure hunting there is because every little new awareness is like elevating the consciousness and the vibration and the, then the abundance and joy that come from that. All right. It's, it's a, it's a, you're right. It's a never ending magical epic process. And it's, we're like on the leading edge of the creation of all that is like the big bang. Right. I, I just had this vision not too long ago that, it, you know, in the beginning there was the word, Right. Well, what is the word? It's a vibration. It's a it's a separation from the base vibration. It's something different. And so that boom, that explosion of contrast and friction that brings us to where we are now. And that is expanding. It's a constant expansion of the of everything. And it's such a beautiful process once. It, well, once I let go of the fear. Uh, so I'll jump to this part of the story. So I was, um, I had went from zero back 20 years ago or so to about 20 million in net worth down to negative $80,000. My store at the mall, which um, I was so excited about, is called Food Forest Abundance. And we had a kiosk that I designed. We put it in the mall. And it was a living kiosk. We sold plant medicines. We sold uh, growing things and we were just preparing to launch the permaculture um, design and install component of the business. And then the government 
came in and of course we that was two years ago we were open for three months we were crushing it in a dead mall we were really doing well and then the government shut it down now people say covid shut it down that's a complete misdirection as you all know covid didn't shut anything down governmente which means mind control right i like settling on that one for a little bit govern means to manage and control and mente means mind if we could just help people see that one truth then it'd be like holy shit so um i i spent and even borrowed some money to get that open because i was already on that path right once i found out what was going on i went through this really it was over about a dozen years of efforting towards the solution and effort came from fear and worry and concern as my resources were being depleted on this effort and in fact there's a book by jerry hicks and he wrote about how most people who are make a lot of money and then start losing it they lose every last penny before they make it again and i read that when i still had a few million bucks left and i said that ain't gonna be me <laughs> Oh, well, there's a reason why they say uh, don't get in the way of a, a, of a wealthy person who lost their money, because what the wealthy person has learned is the consciousness of wealth. And once you get that, the money is just an afterthought. Yeah, it really is. And it was such and I knew this would be the story, too. Like part of me was saying, Jim, this is just part of your freaking process. You're just going to have to go through it. But I was walking down the road and I did a lot of meditating. And sometimes I use cannabis to help me. Um, and I'm walking down the road and I'm taking deep breaths. I'm really going to everything that I'd learned about going deep into the vibration of spirit and connection. And all of a sudden the idea came and I let go of my fear. And, and I, I can see the exact step I was taking, exactly where it happened. And from that moment forward, it's just been magic. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So then I got an idea um, to uh, write Dell Big Tree um, a note. And I spent the next couple of weeks writing this note and meditating and writing. And uh, I went and I saw him in Sanford, Florida. I said, Dell, I love you and your work. And I, I just, I, I wrote this for you and he just, I, I'll never forget how conscious and sincere he was. He just, he looked at that, looked at me, looked at that and he started reading. And I was thinking I'm taking up his time. Like I was all concerned like, and, cause that's kind of how I am. And that's one of the things that I got to I, I get to kind of let go and, and kind of become more aware of. But uh, anyway, he read it. And then next thing you know, we were on the high wire, which was nine and a half months ago. And now we are all over the world, 20 countries, almost every state, helping people grow food. Amazing. And that's what's so encouraging about this movement is, uh, you know, many of us have a little piece of the puzzle. We're all finding each other. And it's a completely different model of the, you know, monopoly, predator, corporate world. And that uh, we realize that when we group together, um, you know, like the predators do, uh, we do it for completely different reasons. We don't see the same kind of competitive factor and we're actually goal oriented for seven generations. You know, what's this world going to look like for your kids, their kids and so forth. And when you do that, you're drafting the universe. And that's why I have no qualm in the world about uh, what the other folks are trying to do, because they've already failed because they're trying to really go against um, you know, the river of life, uh, you know, deny natural law. You just can only do that for so long. And they're, they're already cooked. You can see it. You know, insanity is unsustainable. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yep. it's so ridiculously unsustainable because they're, like you said, they're about competing. They're about winning. They're about dominating and controlling. Those freaking ways just don't work. The collaboration and cooperation and we all live like literally in paradise. In fact, th this idea of ascension, I keep seeing videos come across, people keep sending me things about ascension. And I, I click delete, 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 delete until this past weekend. And I understand, I overstand. I understand now what that means. It's completely Tesla's feel in terms of energy, frequency and vibration. This is happening. 
and it's happening for sure. There's no way, there's no way. And of course, nobody wants to stop it except for a few shameful and, and destructive people. But it's happening so rapidly where the vibration of humanity is rising. And I have a theory. I've never heard this anywhere, but my theory is that the Incas who created the Amazon rainforest in part, like they didn't create it, right? They helped to design it according to what would best serve their culture, right? The Amazon rainforest, if you look this up, was a designed food forest 5,000 years ago. What my belief is that they actually vibrated into a realm that we don't, we don't perceive them in the way we perceive the, the current world. It's a different vibrational frequency. And that's why ayahuasca and some of these plant medicines, they can help us connect with that wisdom, right? I've done seven ayahuasca ceremonies. After every single one of them, I feel so peaceful, so loving, so joyful, so connected with everything that is. Same with psilocybin, right? Of course, the government makes these chemicals illegal. <laughs> Of course they do, <laughs> yeah. because it's yeah. exactly the opposite of government. The plant, that's an interesting idea of the plant technology, which really is a technology, um, is connecting us in this plane to that plane where they have now ascended to. The Mayans, Incans, these 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 civilizations that are probably reverberations from Lumeria or Lemuria and Atlantans, they they developed that technology because I think they were way more in tune with uh, nature's analog uh, forms and probably were able to actually develop new plant life, which is kind of trippy to think of. And it's we're not talking about genetics here; we're talking about waveforms and consciousness. Yes. Um, so that gets really trippy when you start looking in that way. Same with cannabis, right? All the all the aspects of cannabis, like people have postulated that it's come from another planet. Well, maybe it's just been developed from a higher consciousness here that was yeah. originally here. And, you know, ascension, unfortunately, it's been relegated to metaphysical, uh, you know, communities. Uh, if you look at nature, the ascension process is happening continuously with the elements in the ground, with plant species, uh, with things you can actually see with your own eyes in the atmosphere. And all ascension means that you, you are no longer captive or trapped in one particular dimension. You can freely move your conscious between all of these different realms, including materializing the waveforms that manifest what we think of as our physical form. Um, you know, in Ascension also, you know, the Eastern part of the world kept a lot of truths, you know, in the so-called occult uh, understandings alive for a long time. But there's a reason why the Western mind has developed in a different way. Now it's time to put the two hemispheres uh, together. And we live in a wonderful time, like Mike was just saying, that we can explain this in waveform mechanics. And, and I don't want to take the magic out of it because it is magic. Um, if you're in the alchemical lab, uh, you can actually, you know, isolate the three, um, you know, components that all of life, uh, you know, uh, kind of conjugates in order to materialize through. And you can see how one morphs into the other and how the three are formed in the first place. And when you're engaged in agriculture, for instance, and if you have that understanding and that resonance, you know, that the two halves of you, when you put yourself back together, can perceive, then you're in that ascension resonance just with what you're growing in the ground. And, you know, there's an old saying in the Ascended Master teachings, um, which I've been involved with it for a long time. They say, once you contemplate your ascension or even acknowledge that that is a possibility at that moment, your ascension has already begun. Wow, that's so freaking that hits home so well, because when I was 15 or 16, I had heard the term enlightenment for the first time. And somebody described it to me. And I remember it because then I had this, this little chain on at the time. And, and you know, this little thing where if you uh, move the clasp in the back, you make a wish, right? So I moved and I said, my wish is to be enlightened. And I remember that moment crystal clear, exactly where I was outside the wrestling room, walking through the hall. It's, so what you just said there, thank you. That was really neat confirmation. Uh, one last thing, since you mentioned sports, I had some real metaphysical moments in sports, you know, when there's no time left on the clock and, and then for whatever reason, the 
the, the team just kind of comes together and in, and in, in, in this magical sequence and then this stuff happens and you pull off the impossible and uh, just the feeling of that, you know, I know it's a very crude example, but in those moments, it was very special. And uh, that's why to this day, I kind of still, you know, have, uh, you know, fond memories of, of that world. And I think it was good training ground for a lot of things that came later in life. Oh, absolutely. It, it, those, mm -hmm. those moments just stick, they're seared into your mind. They're so crystal clear when we're completely in the moment, in the present with source and really being guided. Not we're, There's no effort in those moments. It's just like, it's like we're being guided by some something epic. Yeah, I think about when I'm like bombing like a double black diamond on my snowboard. I'm yeah. not thinking much, right? It's like reactive. You're just in the flow. Uh, and that's why going back to your uh, wonderful advice about when you feel stressed out, when you're overloaded with all this content and information, go do something. It doesn't really matter what it is, something you're passionate about, fishing, like you yeah. said, tennis, I go trail running, Bear likes to go work out and go dig dig holes <laughs> for, for building fences. <laughs> but no, it's so important, that physical aspect. And that's one thing I was like, so you know this whole ch Canadian truckers thing going on right now? Um, yeah. Um, so I personally believe that this is an important moment. I believe this is an important moment because one Canadians, I don't know if they've ever done this before, <laughs> if they've ever come together and actually acted in a rebellious manner. <laughs> so that alone is a big moment, yes. um, you know, and, and Jim, is that where your accent comes from, by the way? Cause you have a bit of an accent. Yeah. I'm from Minnesota. Ah, so you're, <laughs> you're a, you're basically an American Canadian. Yeah, no. <laughs> exactly. I love it. I love Canada. I love Canadians. Everything about it, but uh, except for I am excited they're growing. <laughs> but my, I bring this up because we're talking today about nature. And we're talking about in the moment. We're talking about those definitive moments, moment to moment between the end caps of that you you basically look back and see as your life, right? And yes, people in this community love to postulate about the conspiracy, conspiracy to the point where I am now calling some of these people conspiratards because all they do is they sit in their mom's basement or in their apartment in the city and they come up with all the conspiracies of how Soros is now manufacturing this truck truck thing because it's going to lead to the downfall of, of human uh, controlled trucks so that Elon Musk can have his automation to um, you know, basically bring in the, the great reset of the food uh, supply chain fallout. And yes, we can spin out on all these conspiracies and all these connections, but also in the moment, there are thousands of blue collar truckers who aren't gonna decide to play video games instead and control their truck from home that are made the conscious effort to go to this app, you know, to do this. And I know people that are there, like our friend Matt Belair was just there in Ottawa experiencing that energetic field and there is an energy behind this there is an energetic that is tied into nature that is tied into this overall idea we've been talking about of abundance of a basically consciousness connecting in the field and while they're yes they probably do these den they put their denizens in to try to control um what they did with like the maga movement and stuff yes that's all happening but we have to look past that we have to go out and do stuff and these truckers yeah. are out doing things just like yeah. you and jim and i were out doing stuff in austin last year last week and just how like we do at the farm here we go out and do stuff so yes it's good to postulate it's good to look at all the connections conspiracies but people go out and do things like these truckers are doing because i'm telling you it is having a massive effect on the field and that's my rant on that and even if soros uh even if Soros started the whole thing, he just shot himself in the foot. Yeah, because this is the other thing and what we'll talk about, right? This is a good segue. Yes. Okay. Let's say it's affecting the supply chain. Good. Good. How many people like the supply chain is for what is for big corporate, big box uh, stores and mega corps that are doing these big ag operations. That's where most of those truckers are moving. When, what, for me personally, I get most of my food through farmers markets, through going to co-ops, to connecting with neighbors, growing my own. That's where we want to go anyways. Globalism in my mind has already failed. So I'm like root, kind of rooting for, the, I don't want anyone to suffer. I don't want anyone to starve. I don't want anyone to 
um, you know, yeah. have to uh, have a hard time. But maybe this is kind of a good thing. And I don't think that NWO or whatever you call them want supply chain disruptions. They want everybody, they want the China model, right? They want everybody to have all of their GMO foods at their fingertips so they can just continue ingesting all the media, playing the video games, loving the, the system that's been set up for them so they can be ignorantly walking into the into the new virtual world. They don't want disruption. They don't want, you know, order out of chaos, sure. But I think there's a fine line here. And I think we need to, I think we need to see that there are amazing things happening and that revolutions can happen. We live in an organic realm. Good things can still happen. And so I just want to say that because I'm getting so much cynicism, this chronic cynicism about how everything's controlled. So, they, they're on top of everything. So anyways, that's my rant. So this is a good segue, Jim. Maybe you could start telling us about your program and uh, how people can get involved. Absolutely. So we inspire and empower people to grow food. And whether that be taking your $20 that you're going to go to the grocery store with and just buying some um, non-GMO plants with seeds in them because they try to get rid of all the seeds in a lot of these um, veggies and fruits and then start propagating those. You go on YouTube and you say, how do I propagate this type of seed? All of a sudden, you've got your own food forest that costs you nothing extra but a few joyful minutes a day. Right. And now when you stack the joy and the return on investment and the value and the benefits to our world, it's just a no brainer. If you want to speed up time, then get a design. Everything starts with the design. We've got uh, now uh, close to 36 people on our food forest abundance design team. And there are designers all over the permaculture network is global. In fact, there, there are millions of people involved. So find a designer and then get a design. Um, we've created a process whereby it's, um, we, our goal is volume. We want to change the world and we want to give people the tools that they need to do so in the most prompt and timely manner possible with the permaculture principles, which means the lowest amount of effort for the highest possible yield, right? And, and take out that word effort, turn that effort into joy, and now it's just a stack of beauty on every level. Um, so we design food for us. Then we also have a cooperative network, which might be the fastest growing cooperative network ever, literally from launch to 110 cooperatives around the world in, in nine months, people that have paid a little bit of money and it's $2,950. And that gets them the co-op. It's like a franchise in one way in that the structure of a franchise has a lot of benefits and a lot of um, good processes and procedures. However, and I spent a quarter million dollars getting a franchise document ready. It was 244 pages of FDD, Fed, Franchise Disclosure Document, and another 89 pages of Operations Manual. I threw the whole pile of shit in the trash <laughs> because every line represented fear and control and government. And so I threw it in the trash. We now have a two page document and it speaks to the voluntary exchange of value. There are no patents, no NDAs and no non-competes. Anybody can come and join us if they want. They can leave us if they want. Um, in fact, we had a guy, he said, he said, Jim, I love this. He goes, but I'm too busy. I don't want to actually install food forests. Um, so I said, hey, we gave him his 2950 back like in a snap. That's great, right? We've got so much abundance flowing our way that it's about expressing that and rising this vibration together. So um, a few details about the cooperative that make it really incredible is we've got layers and layers of support systems right? And you mentioned, Bear, the word puzzle. I look at this like a puzzle and we need all of the pieces of the puzzle in place for it to be a complete puzzle. And at the end of the completion of the puzzle is the Garden of Eden, is abundance everywhere, right? So it's a really fun puzzle to put together. Um, and I'm designing my life according to the principles of permaculture, where I am having so much fun it's just ridiculous <laughs> how much fun I'm having. I mean, I'm sitting here where we're building this sustain, this regenerative, abundant off-grid community called Galt's Landing after John Galt from Atlas Shrugged. If you ever read that, it's so perfect that that book, um, and it, it, it really exemplifies the, the power that every individual has to manifest and create. 
And this community is completely off grid. We're going to create everything we need in abundance to thrive here on this 52 acre property. And we got a private 430 acre lake. We've got the only dock on the lake. There are 10 home sites. We've got four left. And I've got a partner named Marcel, who is an incredibly wealthy and wise entrepreneur and a lion. He's a freedom fighter to the max. He is actually seeding investments in all like all the different freedom fighters around the world that he gets in touch with. He helps them. It's just he, he's actually mind blowingly awesome. Um, anyway, so the whole thing's funded and we're then using this as a stage to demonstrate freedom on every level. Wonderful. So Jim, um, you know, we have uh, our own project going here and what we envision is, uh, you know, we're just a prototype, just, you know, trying to set an example here and then doing some, you know, teaching here on the premises at the farm. But, um, and you're probably way ahead of me on this, but do you see a way where we can get regional resources? For instance, in the Southern Oregon, Northern California here, uh, you know, we have uh, little farms that produce starts for food, uh, you know, organic food, uh, starts for medicinal plants. Uh, you know, we do stuff. And uh, what's great, what I love about you is, you know, you can canvas uh, the entire country or even the world as far as providing designs and the know-how now, let's just say I'm in, in Southern Oregon and I'm working with you and now I need the resources, you know, to, to get all the amendments and the starts or the seeds. Um, do you see some way or are you already doing it where you can uh, have people in the cooperative like, OK, you're in this zone over here. So, you know, here's uh, people in your area that can help you out with what you need. Yes, yes, and yes, on mm -hmm. many different levels. Mm -hmm. One level, it, we, we engaged some amazing, like, scientific thinkers last night, had a conversation about how to take all of the elements of the system, all of the pieces of the puzzle, and how to interlink them, how to connect them. And that's what the cooperative kind of model is all about, is about cooperating to bring everything, all of these um networks together you know I, I just this just popped in my head when the russians uh, pulled out of cuba back in 1989 the cubans were starving because they weren't used to their their free food and their free money and stuff um they within 10 years became the most food producing per capita country in the world or first or second most so what you're saying mike about this all these supply chain issues becoming the catalyst for this we're well timed and anybody out there who wants to be part of the solution, it's an incredible business model. I mean, how much better can you get where you're doing something that on every level is beneficial to yourself and society, and you're making good money doing it. So um, we also have a uh, food coin coming to market. And it's a coin that is a crypto that is actually backed by food. We want to help inspire the food economy, right? The abundance oh, I love that. economy. Yeah. It's really fun. I've had several conversations today with people that are very much more knowledgeable. I'll never be knowledgeable about how that shit works as far as the underpinnings of it or the, the base of it. What I like is just using it, <laughs> right? So yeah. we're, we're incorporating, we're, we're inspiring and attracting these amazing people who have these skills. Again, they're pieces of the puzzle and our intent and what is happening is we're doing the best we possibly can which is just logical to bring it all together and to seeds we've got one guy that's doing a seed um he's really focusing on the seed exchange um and seed and root grange i think it's called anyway that's just new with within our organization we talked to marjorie wildcraft the other day we want to incorporate all of these people we want to bring this incredible details to the world as, as much as possible. Wonderful. So how um, could we all interface somehow? I'd like to have maybe a conversation later or even now, um, you know, because uh, our goals are the same and, you know, there's, there's strength in us coming together. We have a little uh, situation going now where we're, we're uh, establishing the, let's just say the lawful structures that will allow us to do everything we do in private 
And, um, and also we have a whole foundation around it that is a kind of a cooperative uh, movement. There's several farmer types involved, but I'd love to be involved somehow with you guys, uh, if that's and, possible. And, to and Bear, also Bear, to interject mm -hmm. too, what you could provide mm -hmm. and help is the idea of growing our own medicine, which is obviously like mm -hmm. a, so this farm to pharmacy idea that we've been developing, um, Jim, where I think we could provide a lot of um, education for folks looking to get into herbology um, and knowing, depending where they live, what they should be, be able to grow for their own medicine cabinet at home. I love all of that. And the answer is yes, for sure. Um, and you said something there um, regarding a foundation. So we have just been approached by an entity that sounds like we're going to get about $300 million to put food for us in 2,200 private schools around North America. And we don't have for sure the 501c3 yet. We've been working with some pretty famous people that we might be willing or able to use theirs. But anyway, we want to make sure that we use the best option. So is that something that you already have kind of going? Well, um, you know, the 501 has uh, is open to a little bit more scrutiny yeah. and, uh, you know, just people looking over your shoulder. Uh, a 508 is something you might explore because it, uh, the only thing is, is it has to be legitimately based on spiritual um, concepts. We have no problem because our entire mission, you know, our um, our bylaws are about seven generations and it's something we believe in. We're not out there trying to create, uh, you know, any kind of denominational, um, you know, spiritual group, but it's based on a real connection with the land and serving the land. And so, and, and serving people and future generations by being, you know, appropriate stewards to the land. So it fits in perfect with the 508. And then of course, um, that opens you up to a lot of even funding in people that, you know, can do legitimate tax write-offs, even though I really expect the whole taxation system to be uh, shit can very soon, hopefully. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, um, but it allows you to have an interface, whatever the world's going to look like over the next couple of years, uh, legitimately based on philosophical, spiritual principles, and then have your business um, where it should be, which is in the private, and then all the members, rather than a private membership association out in the public, which a lot of people get attacked for that, a lot of practitioners do that, and it just has a lot of uh, pitfalls, I think. You can have a legitimate private membership uh, group that doesn't have to follow government guidelines and all legitimately in the private where it should be and, you know, have the outer uh, structure, the spiritual based structure, you know, interfacing on behalf of that. And then you can even, uh, you know, complex uh, LLCs and things in ways where you can even do business with the beast, but then not by playing shell games, but legitimately um, you know, interface without getting robbed to death in the process. So there's, there's many ways to go about things, but I would say for starters, explore a 508, uh, you know, and it may or may not work for you. A lot of things uh, that people have problems with when it gets into these lawful structures, legal structures, is that uh, people will be selling one particular type of idea or structure. And the truth of the matter is, is just like in any other uh, endeavor, there are many tools and you have to decide what your goals are, which you're trying to achieve and what tools put together in the most intelligent way will serve your needs. I, I, I love what you're talking about. You know way more about this than I do. And I'm so thankful for that. Um, so I, after this call, we'll connect and I'll connect you with mm -hmm. Chelsea and, and this whole group, because it's going to be, I mean, we're talking about $300 million worth of food for us going in schools. It, it's going to, we're going to need you and, and many, many more people to help this happen the most efficient way and get the most food in the ground. I'd like to speak to your thought about this spirituality being the foundation of this one group. Is that now, there's one thing stronger than all of the armies of the world, and that is an idea, which is an enlightenment, whose time has come, right? Well, I, that's so relevant right here, because the idea is enlightenment. The idea is the Garden of Eden. So I would say that it's a, a pretty spiritual concept. <laughs> 
Yeah, proper stewardship and caring about life on in its many forms on uh, in its many levels. Uh, it's about as spiritual as it gets. And it's non denominational. So yeah. it allows everybody to have their own beliefs. But I think, uh, you know, most of us can agree that, you know, those are pretty good ideas. And it also fosters a true uh, love and appreciation for the gifts of uh, that the creator has given us and that, you know, we, we need to share them and pass them on in better shape to future generations. I love it, man. This is, this is so, this is so cool how it's all flowing together because it's logical because it should, because it's just, it's the right time. Yes, and uh, these are new ideas, by the way, uh, no. you know, they've been around for a not. long time. And you know, what we've been taught is uh, history is somehow rife with, um, you know, just war and, you know, and all this stuff that is a little tiny bit of history throughout the course of humanity that has been sold to us so that we think that that's the way it is and that mankind is inherently evil and that somehow we need governments to control us. Exactly. 1984 didn't happen. <laughs> like people think that 1984 is a future dystopia. No, 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 no. It's happened a long time ago. Right. And, and this idea whose time has come. I love the way Victor Hugo stated that because the idea in, whose time has come implies that the ar idea already exists. Of course it does. You know? Yeah. It's a it's a beautiful puzzle. Yeah. Oh, one yeah, other thing. Stuff. This blew my mind. I didn't know who Victor Hugo was. I still don't to a large degree, but I like the quote, but I thought I better see who he was just in case he's a deep state scumbag. And the first picture of his art that I saw was a magic mushroom. Uh, <laughs> I yeah. was like, wow. Interesting. Yeah, they, they definitely want to hide that stuff. You also yeah. brought up Gerta and, um, you know, a lot of people don't understand that he was, uh, um, more instrumental in other things than what people realize, which is why Rudolf Steiner did his doctoral um, dissertation on Goethe. And uh, there's a great book called, I believe it's Mind and Matter, read it a long time ago. But, um, you know, it's a collaboration of Goethe and Steiner's perspective. And the author escapes me at the same time where he was a, a student of Steiner's. But uh, in a nutshell, it teaches you how to look at the world uh, with um, a critical uh, mindset and be able to ascertain the truth in any circumstances, no matter what. It's a whole different way of piercing the veil and uh, probably, you know, maybe along the lines of trivium, quadrivium only on an even deeper level than the way we talk about that these days. So uh, a lot, to unpack there and I'd, I'd recommend anybody going into mind and matter and just you know getting that uh whole uh perceptive ability to see spirit within all things yeah beautiful power versus forest by hawkins was mm -hmm. one of my pivotal books that helped mm -hmm. me and helped me to see more clearly mm -hmm. well jim this is uh this is amazing here and um We'll continue. Any anything? Uh, yeah, I know we have a lot of to talk about. So anything uh, that you you want to cover here? You know, uh, sure. I, I will um, kind of define a little in more clear terms what the actual business is. So a cooperative oh, part. Yeah, a cooperative partner. What they're what they do, what they get to do is they get to use the blueprints that are designed by our professional food forest landscape designers. And they get to go to the customer's house and meet with the customer and install the food forest, which means they'll go and work with the local nurseries, the local soil providers. And then eventually they'll create a network that everybody supports each other because we all have the same and vision in mind. And so it becomes a very supportive network. So the co-op's job, I use that term kind of fun, um, is basically landscaping. It's hyper-functional landscaping. It's freedom landscaping. And we basically run it just like a landscaping business. The margin is about 40% typically, right? So you've got your cost of goods and materials. You've got your cost of labor and you've got your company profit margin. 
an average job right now is going to be near 20, maybe up to 25,000. And part of the reason it's, it's been going up quite a bit is because we are now coming to market with a financing arm. So we're going to be able to finance the installation of food forests and nurseries, which I think is so neat. So um, at 20,000, our company gets 7% and the net, profits after a five a four or five day install are going to be six or seven thousand dollars to the cooperative partner and it's scalable if you want to have 10 crews doing 10 installs at the same time absolutely we would help that happen and then our mission at corporate and this is the same mission i had in the in the mortgage company and i look back on the history of my life and everything was perfect for me, me to be sitting here right now our mission was to serve the loan officer. And so we took our corporate team and our, our processing team and we served them because they're out meeting the customer. They're out, they're out getting the business. So our mission is to serve our cooperative partners in every way that we can think of. Uh, for instance, we just decided the other day to create worm uh, compost tea brewers. 55 gallon drums with all the necessary elements in there to create compost tea. And we're sending them to all of our cooperative partners, which becomes another layer of business where they can be going back once a month or whatever the logical time is and putting, applying compost tea to their food forests, which the return on that investment is incredible. So those are the type of things and we're never, we're always looking for more ways to serve. And, and that's the fun of the business. And just worm production, uh, you know, you start a worm farm, you can ship those anywhere in the world. And yeah, uh, yeah there, there's so many offshoots. One thing uh, we do here is, um, you know, we have, uh, since we're in the nursery business, we have our wholesale numbers and things. So we make uh, bulk orders for organic amendments and things. Yeah. And uh, before we make an order, we just uh, get on the local grapevine and, you know, we have a local permaculture group and, uh, you know, a lot of independent people in the area. And we just put word out that, okay, next month, in fact, we're doing it right now, getting ready for spring. Uh, we're going to do a big order and uh, everybody puts their stuff in. We all get stuff at cost. If somebody, you know, wanted to, we don't do that just because we're all friends, but if somebody wanted to just put a little 10% premium so you can make it worth your while and, and the members still get, you know, a discount. Uh, but either way, it, it's great. And then we, uh, you know, have uh, big flatbeds. It'll go to a central area or come here to the farm and everybody will drive up in their trucks, get their stuff and, and it works great. So that's one of the ways that, you know, we all work as a group in our little location here. That's so beautiful. What our goal would be to take what you've done and, and write it on paper in a way that's duplicatable and then share that whole business model. Um, I just met with Joel Salatin the other day and we're doing the same thing with him. We're meeting um, next week. And my, our communication was that we're going to, and he's already done all this, but most yeah, people we don't love know Joel. about it. Yeah. I love Joel. I, he's been one of my heroes for a long time. And so to speak with him, you know, I share the stage with him um, was fantastic. And he loved what I said. And, and so course i love what he says so anyway it was a we really were both fanboys there in austin we're like that's yeah. joel let's Joel. Let's go get a picture with him yes yes <laughs> yes there's only a few people i've ever gotten pictures with and he's one of them <laughs> um that's so funny. yeah so we're gonna take that model and we're gonna duplicate it in a way that a, somebody who's sitting behind a desk some business professional who hates their job but has the resources and the gumption to go do what they really want to do we're going to lay it out as a business plan on paper for them. Boom. And then we're going to add all the food for support and affiliates and help. And, you know, just to help that come to market in, in a, in, like Joel said, what did he, he said? It, he said, I don't like to rush things, but I like to move quickly. Right. And that is so, of course, permaculture wise, we want to scale it where it can go very quickly and not be rushed. Yes. Yeah, our saying here is take your time, just hurry up. Yes, I love that. 
<laughs> That's exactly right. Time what's is interesting. What's interesting about what Joel's doing too is he's he's seeing the the need for e-commerce with local with this, right? So while we're saying go local vor and such too, that also doesn't mean we're going to be ice is- completely isolated. I mean, we have the internet; we can use this to connect each other. Alpha Vedic, that's our, we sell product all over the United States right now. We're, don't worry, Canada, we're making our way to get to you soon in Mexico, Mexico and the rest of the world. It's taking time, but that's our model. And so we ship all over. And so there needs to be a fine balance here. And you mentioned the food coin idea and there's people triggered by crypto in the chat here. We've had a nice little chat going on about what money is and the energy cool. of money and money being being basically save time and all this. But if you do the crypto the right way, that is extremely powerful because it's backed by, backed by something tangible. And we talked about, Jim, about this and this non-fungible token idea of being able to invest in a farm. Imagine if you guys could invest in Alpha Vedic by literally tokenizing um, one of our vines and that vine or that trellis, excuse me, that trellis became your trellis that now you had a direct investment in and you had a track, you could track that on an open ledger where you could see, okay, I believe in Alpha Vedic. I'm going to invest. Now I have a piece of it that I literally have, I own, partly own, and that'll allow me to come to the farm as a member of this p- private business organization or wherever we set it up. And then you can now sell that. Let's say that you are moving on to something else. It was a great investment. Alpha Vedic's crushing it. You have this that's proven to be yours. Now you can transfer that and sell that to somebody else. And it's microfinancing farms in a way that is very unique and awesome. And you could be doing that from anywhere in the world. So I don't see any issue with that. I feel like that's exciting. And that's using these tools of technology to our own benefit. I love it. That's uh, that's the one uh, thing that I have had a hard time connecting with cryptos is because there's no value. Now, if we can somehow do what Mike is talking about and attach that value, whether it's food or, you know, services. And then to me, that's that's a, the, the perfect blend of all worlds. Yes, it is the food economy. Uh, I don't like fiat of any kind, Bear. I'm 100 percent with you. I think they're all going by by eventually. I've got some, uh, some cryptos and I've made money with crypto, but I know it's a shell game. And so therefore I think this is the solution when when we, and and by the way, like I, I I mentioned to the group, I said, I don't want anything to do with ownership or anything. This is a community owned thing. So let's structure it that way. And they love, they're like a hundred percent agreed. So that was kind of cool. Yeah. You know, another thing that people need to understand in these kinds of models, we're not talking about uh, uh, a community like in a communistic way because we're all independent entities. We all, um, you know, have a, 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 a real need to preserve our independence because that's what all this is about in the first place. And then there's ample opportunities within this kind of cooperative that you're describing where we can be taken care of very nicely and, um, you know, have all of our needs met and actually grow our personal wealth. So, you know, a true uh, business model uh, should be win-win where everybody prospers, but at the same time, we share an infrastructure so that there's no burden on any one individual at the same time. Yep. I couldn't agree more. It's exactly right. Regenerative capitalism, capitalism that is transparent at every level. There are no poisons. There's no death. There's no, no destruction at any level of the supply chain. And it, when you take food local, that's the one thing that is to me the easiest thing. Of course, raising our vibration is number one, but along with that will come local regenerative agriculture and that supply chain that that's the foundation of all of it as far as we, we will reverse mass extinction we will reverse deforestation cancer heart disease diabetes trends all of the forms of tyranny get taken out not by going to war with them but by mm. simply turning our resources and using our resources consciously i mean look at mm-hmm. nature inherently is deflationary it creates abundance. It's not in, you know, in the sense that look what a treat one tree can do for you. It can provide you for generations of foods, depending on the type of tree, right? So 
that idea of of grounding uh, the transfer of of value into nature, into abundance, into healing, as Renette Sentiment uh, had talked. Saying, excuse me, I always say her name wrong. Uh, um, but as as she was talking about, right, uh, Bear, this uh, idea of having an economy based on healing while having an economy based on natural abundance, <laughs> this is where we're all going, guys. This is what's happening right now. And it's very exciting. It sure if, is. Uh, <laughs> if, if we have a couple of moments, uh, I'd like your comments just about soil science. Uh, one of the things that I we're trying to promote here. Um, is looking at soil science in a whole different way. So rather than just analyzing with soil samples and seeing what might be deficient or so forth, you know, biodynamics, of course, if you have a place where you have animals and you can create the whole natural loop and it's great, it maintains itself. Um, but not everybody can do that. But with uh, ionization soil science, which is uh, what I've been involved with for a long time, now you're taking that alchemical understanding into the soil itself and realizing it's not about the nitrogen, it's not about the potassium, the trace metals, it's about a line of electrical resistance because everything is electrical, including plants and soil and the organisms in the soil. So the, the testing allows us to establish uh, what the electrical vectors in the soil are. We do that by extrapolating the chemical samples into electrical through mathematical computations. And I know this sounds nerdy, but it's, you know, once you get the hang of it, it's no big deal. But here's the point. When you do that, then you uh, do very moderate or minimal tweaking. And so you do not have to waste as much resources just to keep things growing every year. And at the same time, you are building topsoil for every succeeding plant season without burning the soil out, which you can do even with uh, organic amendments, you know, you can, uh, you know, burn the soil out because you're just trying to yield more, yield more. Doesn't matter if you're doing it organically or otherwise. So uh, what we're really wanting to get out there is just a more enlightened way of looking at soil, which is the way we're starting to look at everything these days, which is this is an electrical universe. Our thoughts have everything to do with what gets here in the first place. And how do we take that understanding down on the ground, apply it to medicine, apply it to um, everything, including growing our food and fulfilling that seventh generation mission statement in the first place. Mm. While you're talking, the ideas are just exploding in my mind, right? <laughs> okay. Could we um, engage you to speak to our whole co-op uh, about this and how to get to seed those ideas that you're talking about? So because once that seed is planted with our group, it's only going to grow. So I I'd, I'd, I'd be I'd be happy to. Absolutely. Oh, that's so exciting, Bear. I'm so thankful for this. Holy cow, this is sparking <laughs> well, a whole new thing. We're talking about economics on the chat still. And as Bear was talking about soil, it's so obvious this as above, so below idea. Like, how does it how does it really work? You give to the soil, right? You give the new you, you know, by building the compost, it's us constantly giving back. Give, give, give. If you try to pull and take. It, what happens is you have end up having infest, you know, in infested crops, crops that are di you know, your plant life is is sickly, and we've seen that with monocropping because it was take, 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 and then try to make up with shortcuts with chemicals. So we live in a give and give more universe, and so that's where, and literally, the soil is telling us that nature tells us every day. And when we give to her, what happens? She gives us so much more and so much more. And it's really something I think the number one lesson we should learn from today's chat is always remember give and give more. Yeah. That's if you want to cure scarcity consciousness, just get out there and start planting things, and you'd be amazed. Yeah, it's the immediate cure because it, as soon as you start doing it, you don't feel scarcity anymore. Like it's just gone. Yeah. yeah, replaced by abundance. Hey, Jim, this is a great talk. I know we're coming up on our time here. Uh, any final things you'd like to to depart with? Uh, some nuggets of truth or any uh, 
I or actually, you know, give us an idea of too what the outlook is for the next like six months for your food for its abundance model, where you guys are going. I know you've already outlined a lot. We'd want to have yeah. you come back on too in about six months to tell us how your land project's doing and everything that's moving forward. But um, yeah, and then let us know where people can find you. We'll make sure to put all the links below. Okay, so um, I'm here and I, it is a little bit windy outside. If you would like, I can take you on a quick walk through some of the Centropic agroforestry. And I know there's a lot of people just listening, but I could kind of describe it as I'm going. Is yeah, I'd love to see that myself. Okay, awesome. I'm unplugging, grab my apple, and I'm going to start walking. Um, so right over here where the tractor's going, we've got a pathway, a permaculture pathway. I'll send you the design on this pathway, but it's going to have many different features and different experiences, about 12 curves. Every curve is going to be a new type of food forest, a new focus, right? We've got banana circles, we've got medicinal herbs, all sorts of things like that. Um, and then as we go over here, we're putting up these greenhouses. Um, this is a temporary greenhouse, it's a hoop house. And these hoop houses are gonna be for all the thousands of starter plants that we got going. Right here, we've got an off-grid solar system. If anybody out there wants an off-grid system. I've been kind of dabbling around the edges of solar for many years. And this is my, I actually bought three of these systems. They're 15,000 bucks a system. And it comes with the batteries, um, a full battery backup. So we bought three of them to use here. Now, um, I noticed the generator's on over here because we're pumping a lot of water. I was going to ask Jim what your water situation is there. So see the roof line? Now here we've got a six, six acre pond. And at this pond, we're going to be um, loading that up. Now, I, my favorite thing is water and ponds. And as far as a protein source, you can get, I think, four times as much out of a pond or quite a bit more than you can get out of any land animal. Um, so we're going to be loading this up with different types of fish. And then um, I'm going to kind of hustle a little bit. So all this area here is going to be, we're going to have some cattle. And then at the end, we're going to have some hogs. There's a lot of wild hog in the area. So we're going to trap them. Um, and we're going to have a diversity of different edibles. In fact, I'm going to live here the rest of my life, knock on wood. Um, and this is, I'm never going to stop. It's like my, my biggest joy is to keep putting new stuff in the ground and keep learning new stuff. Um, there's one thing that I can't figure out here. And that is that we've got, we're in the middle of the woods and there are deer and animals and wildlife all over. And our food forests, we've got seven or eight different types of lettuces and all this other stuff. And the deer aren't eating any of it. Well, Why? Does anybody good, have an idea? Good for you. I I wish our deer were like your deer. You got some picky yeah, picky deer. Maybe they've just got an abundance of other food sources around. That that's the most logical explanation. Um, I have done mushrooms here several times, and I just asked for help from nature. So I was thinking maybe that had something to do with it, but. That's getting kind of out there, so I probably not. <laughs> Maybe, who knows? Um, so here, we put in some um, centropic rows, right? And we've got so far about 100 different species of plants, and we've got about 2,000 feet of, of, of centropic agroforestry. So we've got hey, about- 40 Hey, Jim, can you briefly explain for our audience what centropic, what that means, what that term means? Yes, and I'm going to explain it the way I understand it. We got rows of food. <laughs> right? Now, the reason um, we did it in this area as rows, just rows of a diversity of food, right? So pineapples, we had a big freeze for, well, for it was 28 degrees. For Florida, that's a big freeze. So a, a lot of them got a little bit of an injured, but they're all, so far, it looks like they're all going to come back. Um, 
So we've got about a hundred different species of food growing here. And look at all the perennial lettuces and moringa and uh, you name it, it's here. There's papaya, papaya got a little bit fry, but not too bad. Nasturtium, I didn't know this, but these nasturtium flowers, I just learned this like three days ago. See how beautiful that is? Super edible. Mm. They're so good. Yeah. They're so delicious. Now, I'll share one other thing about lettuces and, and spinaches. Like, this is um, Okinawa spinach. This stuff here, along with longevity spinach and Suriname spinach, these are perennial spinaches that are fantastic. They're way more nutrient dense than any lettuces you can buy at the store. And they're free. They're just growing all over the place. Look at this. This is a longevity spinach, and it tastes better than lettuce. So, so yeah, that's, this is one spot. We've got several other spots that are like this. You know, Moringa, the tree of life. Mm. Like, this is no maintenance farming. You walk in, and we make it so you can drive your car right up and down the row, and you can harvest. This has only been in the ground four months. And we've already got more food than we can eat. So you guys uh, get a decent amount of rainfall there too, and are using the catchment pond. You're not going. Are you going to do swales at all? It seems pretty flat there. So yeah, it's, it's Florida your... flat, and we do have some swales in certain areas. And hey, they're kind of design features because we're using this as a demonstration site. So we're putting in a lot of different features, partly because it's also an educational tool. Got it. Yeah. Um, in fact, I just asked the guys working, I said to them, go into the gardens and take as much as you can bring home. Because, ha, I mean, we can Bok we're not choy. Eating. Bok choy for days. Yeah, look at that. We're not eating this near fast enough, and we don't have a distribution system set up yet. So I'm just telling people, take it. I mean, this is abundance, right? What are you guys using for mulch there? Kind of hard to see. Is that wood chips or what are you doing yeah, there? Wood, yep. It's wood chips. And we just got a bunch of uh, pine, pine mulch because we've got a very alkaline soil here. So we got the pine mulch to help give some acidity to the soil and balance it out. That's funny. We have a very acidic, awesome. acidic soil here. So I'm always trying to <laughs> balance that out. Um, dude, that looks incredible, man. I can't wait to come visit and enjoy that. Well, one, that climate and two, all that beautiful tropical abundance you're growing there. Yeah, I, I can't Amazing. wait to show you around, you guys. It's going to be a lot of fun. Well, and you make a good point, Jim. We talk about the the whole scarcity mindset, poverty mindset, how that's just trapped so many people into fear. And then you have these people who are seeing the potential collapse and how um, they uh, are like, how do we protect ourselves with guns and uh, store our food? But if you do this model, you create enough abundance, you should have plenty of food to go around for your neighbors and for everyone because it's just inherent to how nature works. We're designing it that way on purpose. And then our goal is to first, we're going to go to the local community and we're going to start sharing our abundance in a way that they're going to create their own abundance within time. And then it's going to spread out like that. Um, because I do think there's issues coming with the supply chain and they, they're probably going to be very um, bad for some people, for people yep. who don't have these type of resources. So we're sharing this knowledge as fast as we can. Beautiful, brother. Good for you. Fantastic. Uh, can't wait to come out and visit you someday there. Yes, I'm looking forward to that, Baron. I want to learn from you. You know so much stuff that I don't know. I want to learn it. Well, we all, we uh, like we said before, we all have a little piece of the puzzle. So uh, I look forward to learning uh, from you as well. Um, awesome. That's uh, just amazing. This has been really inspiring. You know, I'm looking out my window at our farm here and uh, we've got a little bit of colder weather. So we're, um, you know, just sort of making more indoor plans right now, but we're ready to get yep. out there too. And, uh, and now I'm inspired after talking to you today to hurry up and get started. I love it. I love it, my friends. Well, have an awesome day and I'm looking forward to chatting many more times. Yeah. Sounds good, Looking Jim. Looking forward to a long collaboration, and uh, thanks for making time with us, Jim. Really oh. appreciate it. Thank you, guys.
Very food, well. Foodforestabundance.org, correct? Dot com. Dot com. Food yeah. fundance, uh, foodforestabundance.com. <laughs> I will put the link in the show notes below. Please go. Let's spread this across the uh, across the world, guys. Uh, food forests in every house in you know, everywhere we go. And we just go, we pick fruit everywhere we go. We just eat while we walk. <laughs> <laughs> fruit everywhere. And we're putting 100% of our net monthly profits after we take our salaries and stuff back in by planting food forests in public areas at schools and churches and community centers because we're not going to pay taxes to an entity that we are at war with. Yep. Yep. Awesome. Love we're you guys. Have you. a good one. Ciao. Better, Jim. Hey, yeah. love you a lot, Jim. Love you too, guys. You. That guy's doing it. He's doing it. I uh, hope this is an inspiring one. Uh, Bear, I know you guys have been planning over at the farm, and I'll come over and do it to do more walk and talks like that too, because they are extremely mm -hmm. inspiring. And to see out, you know, the outside of what's happening, like we got to get out of this room sometimes when we're talking here. So, yeah, uh, Deb and I, I uh, were just talking this morning, Mike, and we're saying, okay, it's time to start doing the walk and talks. And uh, we're, we're looking at March 1st to just do regular ones. And, you know, we have a pretty busy guest lineup. So we might even throw in um, even just 10, 15 minute walks for a second episodes every week. And I yeah. know we want to do more in-house talks too, uh, you know, just about other things. And uh, I know we're busy. I don't want to commit to anything, uh, you know, ahead of time, but I think it's probably going in that direction. Yeah, exactly. So time is an illusion. So um, we'll make Thank time. Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> hey guys, I hope you enjoyed this chat. Jim's always a blast. You know, I hung out with him in Austin and um, that guy's energy is infectious and he's, he's out there living the dream. Um, he's got a great new trailer out. I think it's on the site with Adrian Grenier. The, uh, if I said Adrian's name, right, he's the actor from Entourage. Uh, he's supporting them. They're doing, they're doing amazing work. And, you know, I got to give it up to Jim. Like, um, he's, he's a full spectrum, uh, guy. He sees it from all angles like us. Right. So it's not, you know, yep. he gets it. So, uh, can't wait to hang out with him again. Thanks everybody for joining us and we'll see you next week for another episode of alpha cast. Love you. Remember, get outside, get your hands in the dirt, go for a walk, uh, go, go plant something. Mother nature is the best, uh, educator. She is here for us. Go give back to her. Love you all. And we'll see you again next time. Cheers.